the team aspect is just unmatched. Like really our sport is traditionally known for being an individual sport that I go in the ring and I'm trying to beat you. And I, you might be from my same barn and I hope you do well too, but I really would prefer to beat you. So the yeah. team yeah. aspect of this is, is really, it, it teaches something that you really aren't going to learn in, in traditional showing. And that is, you know, you're rooting for your beginner rider to win their class just as much as your open rider, because when you put their points on the chart at the end of the day, they count the same. And your beginner rider is just as important to your team winning that day as your open rider is. Mm-hmm. So uh, so it, it really makes the kids, um, gives them an opportunity to bond, to root for each other, to work together, to learn from each other, and, you know, to really develop deeper friendships. I think all of us who are connected through horses have a you know, an, an instant tie that binds inherently. Um, but, you know, put put them together on a team. And not only do we all love horses, but we're all competing for the same team. Now it's it's a lot of fun. It adds a lot more fun and camaraderie to the whole thing. Welcome to the Practical Horseman podcast, featuring conversations with respected riders, industry leaders, and horse care experts. The show is co-hosted by Practical Horseman editors, and our goal is to inform, educate and inspire. I'm Julia Murphy and this week's episode is with the Interscholastic Equestrian Association's co-founder and executive director, Roxanne Durant. You may recognize that name more in its short form, the IEA, the middle school and high school program that offers riding opportunity to kids and teens across the country. Established in 2002, Durant was one of the founding members of the nonprofit organization. Beginning with just 200 participants, The IEA now has over 14,500 members across 46 states in North America and supports three disciplines, hunt seat, western, and dressage. Durant will explain in the podcast that she wanted to create a program that introduced middle school and high school students to the draw-based competition format to set them up for success on college riding teams. She was inspired in high school when she was riding, but saw a gap in representation between school teams like football and baseball versus riding teams. Many schools not only set up their student athletes for success in college, but also celebrated their victories. Durant didn't see the same thing happening for riders or riding teams. So later in life, she wanted to find a way to integrate riding teams more into school athletics, and her story came full circle when she helped found the IEA. In this episode, you'll learn all about the IEA from Durant and what it's all about. She also discusses the disciplines and divisions in the IEA, how the team atmosphere of IEA riding contributes to growth and relationship building, and how she thinks the organization has impacted kids across the country. Before we get into the podcast with Durant, I'd like to thank the sponsor of this week's episode and a proud sponsor of the IEA, Troxel, and share their message. Troxel would like to introduce the new Terrain Helmet. This next-level, low-profile helmet features 12 extra-large vents and a frontal reinforcement cage for maximum airflow and added impact resistance. With a patented moisture-wicking cool core headliner treated with innovative fuse technology that fights odor-causing bacteria, this helmet is engineered for cool, comfortable rides. Now, enjoy the episode with Durant. Thank you again for hopping on. And I just wanted to learn a little bit more about you. So could you tell me a little bit about yourself and what your role is in the IEA? Yes. So uh, I am one of the original founders of the IEA, and I currently serve as the executive director. So um, the the IEA concept actually started, so we, we just celebrated our 20th anniversary of IEA, but the concept started three years before that with an event that I put on called the Interscholastic Invitational. And it was meant to introduce high school kids to the format of draw-based riding that they were going to face in college. So if you were going to ride on a college team, you better be comfortable with that draw-based format. And a lot of kids were intimidated by it. Um, At the time, I was working for a uh, school, a private high school that had just built a beautiful equestrian facility. It was a girls' school that had built a beautiful equestrian facility. And uh, I just thought if we're a college prep, you know, school, then we should be college prep on the riding side too. And so, you know, learning to ride in a draw-based format 
is what would prepare you for co collegiate riding. So we started with this um, interscholastic invitational, and actually I brought Bob Cashion in to uh, help pitch the idea, and I, again with the idea of getting kids comfortable with the format. So we did that interscholastic invitational for three years, and then suddenly that morphed into the beginning of the official IEA, which we have now. So, um, so I, I started the IEA um, through that path, sort of by accident, but uh, with a lot of help from some other our, our, the co-founders, uh, Tim Boone, who was our lawyer, uh, as we really got up and running with the IEA, uh, Wayne Acker, who was he, I met Wayne actually as a steward at one of the first invitational shows. He was a college coach in the area and came to be a steward for our interscholastic invitational. And he said, oh, this is going to be big. This is going to be great. We got to make this mm -hmm. bigger. And he uh, brought together the dream team, which was uh, the original founders of myself, Tim Wayne, and also Myron Leff, who went on to become our, our marketing director and um, chief operations officer for most of the last 20 years. So. So anyway, I started as founder and I currently work as the executive director and uh, my role as executive director. Really, I do a lot of the business management of the IEA um, and oversee, you know, the, the bookkeeping and finances and payroll and employment and all of those aspects. Uh, in addition to being involved with all the committee work and the rules and ethics and things like that, that that keep things running at the horse show level. Excellent. And can you just explain a little bit more about the IEA and what it is? Yes. So the IEA is the Interscholastic Equestrian Association, and um, it is a draw-based format for middle school and high school students. So uh, riders in grades four through 12. And the concept is that you don't have to own a horse and, you know, own or lease a horse and bring the horse to the horse show that you go to a host site, a, a member, a member facility of the IEA will host an event and um, at an IEA show, you come there and you will draw a horse's name out of a hat, essentially, and uh, it levels, you'll ride a horse, like let's say if you're doing flat and fences, you would ride a different horse, most likely for flat and for fences. Um, there's generally, depending on your ability level, but usually you would do two classes at the horse show. Um, but you don't have to bring your horse there and all of the complications and expense that's involved with that. Um, the host mm -hmm. facility will provide the horse. The horses are leveled by ability level to match the rider's abilities. And we offer three disciplines. We offer hunt seat, which is our largest. It was the primary discipline we started with because that was my main background. Um, we have hunt seat, western, and dressage and offer all three disciplines across the country. And going back into your background a little bit, do you still ride or what was your your history with, with riding that helped inspire this idea? Yeah, well, the whole thing, I always, I always sort of say that the whole thing started with a little chip on my shoulder from when I was a high school rider myself. So um, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, I rode, I, I went to a wonderful private school there that had a riding program as part of its athletic offerings. And so it was just a wonderful life of, you know, class got out and you walked over to the barn and you rode your horse and hung out at the barn all afternoon. And then your mom picked you up and drove you home. And, you know, it was just a great experience. And I, it, I, I loved it. I loved the horses. I loved that way of life. I loved that it was incorporated with my school life and school friends as well. Um, but the one thing throughout my high school years when I was there, it always made me mad that they didn't put like a picture of the riding. We didn't, we weren't, weren't really a riding team, mm -hmm. but they didn't put a picture of like the riding kids or the riding team, you know, in the school annual. And mm -hmm. they didn't, we didn't get to stand up on Monday morning and say, oh, here's what we won this weekend. You know, the football captain might stand up in assembly and say, well, we won our game this weekend. And you know, some other team, but we didn't get to do that. And we didn't get our picture right. in the annual one. And we didn't get to go to the spring sports banquet and things like that. And I always felt, you know, I, I, I was upset about that. And I kept writing up proposals as a student to the head of school and saying, you know, can we call ourselves a team? Can we create a team or a club or something that would, you know, at least get our picture in the yearbook? 
and they wouldn't let us do that. And, um, you know, we kind of didn't fit into their mold of athletics or clubs or whatever. And little by little, the school phased out the equestrian program and the rings became soccer fields mm-hmm. and and Too that bad. kind of thing. Yeah. So I always felt like my dream job would have been to go back to that school and show them how great the riding program could be and how it really could be integrated into athletics. And um, so then when when I, I had a job, this job opening at a school here in Ohio, I, I live in uh uh, Chagrin Falls, Ohio now, but this was in the, in the Cleveland area. Um, the, the Andrews School had built this just beautiful equestrian facility with everything, state-of-the-art everything. Uh, and that's that's where I thought, well, this is the closest I'm ever going to get to my dream job of working mm-hmm. at a school that's really endorsing a riding program. And uh, so I, that was my dream job. And that's where, when I jumped into that job and then was able to take it into those interscholastic invitationals and morph on into the IEA, which apparently was my destiny, I guess. That's amazing. And I mean, it's done so many kids, including myself, such a huge <laughs> favor because I mean, I went to a high school where we didn't have a team at all. So having the capability of joining a team at that age that wasn't necessarily associated with your high school is just, you know, the best, an opportunity that may not have happened otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because when we first started IEA, we did want it to have a school affiliation similar to the collegiate programs. And, um, and, and we even said, you know, uh, just you use your school name when you name your team. And if you'll just have somebody at your school sign this form that says, Mm-hmm. I realize there is a team named, you know, North High Team out there competing with our name. I mean, that's all we wanted to say. It was just sign a form saying we acknowledge that you're using our name. Right. And um, we didn't, frankly, we didn't care if, who signed it. If the janitor signed it, that was fine with us. <laughs> I wanted somebody to acknowledge that they were having a team. And there was so much pushback from the schools, you know, oh, gosh, riding, that's a liability. Oh, gosh, we can't possibly put our name on that. And so um, that's when we had to go the other route of allowing um, barn teams as well. So there are school teams, but primarily there are barn affiliated teams. And um, ultimately, we thought, well, maybe we can't get in the front door at the schools, but we could at least get in the back door so that if, mm-hmm. if kids through our program are getting into colleges, they might not otherwise or getting onto teams and getting scholarships that they wouldn't otherwise then suddenly the schools put their arms around them and go, oh, look what this great kid did at our school. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that seems to have worked. And and ultimately, the kids are getting the opportunity, whether it was through the front door or the back door. At least the kids are getting the opportunity. And little by little, I think the schools are, are buying in when they see kids getting opportunities they wouldn't have otherwise because of their participation in riding. Then the schools want to endorse that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to the IEA a little bit, can you describe what the different levels of competing looks like? Yes, yes. And uh, we do have, it's basically the same ability levels for all three of our disciplines. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we do offer beginner, novice, intermediate, and open. So um, beginner, we have two levels and and speaking particularly, you know, hunt seat and dressage, that would be walk, we have a walk trot or a walk trot canner beginner and so the rider would be in one or the other uh and then for novice it is uh on the on the hunt seat side let me just go through hunt seat and then we'll do dressage separately so on the hunt seat side at the novice level there are two classes offered and that is a um novice over fences which is a cross rail level over fences class and then a basic flat class and then um, in the intermediate, you go up a level to there. So the jumps are two foot now at intermediate and then a flat class. And then in the open, and the open is only offered at the high school level, not at the middle school level. Uh, mm-hmm. In the open, the jumps are two foot six and a flat class. And then each of the flat classes, um, you know, there's that we have a list of, I think it's 13 tests. And so, you know, the the beginner level has to be able to do tests, you know, like one through five, which is all walk trot level or walk trot yeah, right. walk track level for the walk track group and and then on up through you know the open should be able to counter canter and ride without stirrups and more advanced things so um so the they're 
they're placed um, based on their initial ability level and experience, you know, prior to coming into the IEA. Um, on the dressage, it's really a matter of incorporating the tests in. So at the beginner level, it's just um, a, what they call a dressage seat equitation class. So it is a flat class, um, group flat class, but it's based on dressage seat um, mm -hmm. basics and, and equitation and positioning and all that. So uh, again, we do a walk trot or a walk trot canner at the beginner level. And then at novice, we begin to incorporate the test level. Um, so there is a, a novice level test then at that point, an individual test. So then they get a, two classes once they get to the novice level, a test class. And uh, and the, the test at the novice level is, is done in the smaller square, smaller dressage arena. And then at intermediate, they have uh, also a test and a, a DSE, a dressage sheet equitation class. And then they would perform the intermediate test. And then for the open, we go to the larger square, the larger arena, and they would right. do the, the open level test and flat class. So, and the equivalent in in, in Western, if um, anyone's interested in the Western side, is uh, sure. that we do the we moved into the reigning as the individual class. So basically, everybody gets a group flat class and a group and an individual performance class. And so the equivalent in the Western is we start into ranch riding and then work our way up to uh, a, a modified reining pattern and then a full NRHA reining pattern. Wow, very cool. Yeah, so there's something for everybody and yeah. every, and you know, our, our minimum requirement is that you've had at least six months of instruction. We do require that you know how to canter even if you're only performing at the walk and trot that you at least know how to canter because it just, you know, there's a possibility that horse may break into a canter and you better mm -hmm. know how to canter a couple mm -hmm. strides to tell them not to canter at least. So, um, but but at least six months of instruction and the ability to canter on a on an unfamiliar horse and you're on your way in the IEA. <laughs> Amazing. And uh, what do you think that the IEA does for kids across the country? There's so many opportunities like I mean we have all three dif disciplines now and uh, you said the hunt seat's the biggest but with hunt seat dressage and western you basically have you're offering it to kids all over the country from any different riding background so how do you think it what do you think the IEA does for these kids? I think the main thing the IEA does is is provide accessibility uh, so I think, you know, you could go through the lists and the statistics and the studies that show what riding horses in general or being in sports in general does for youth participants. Um, all those things about self-confidence and learning self-esteem and, and learning, you know, how to accept failure and success and, and camaraderie and all those things. But I think it, in the world of equestrian sports where IEA does a very specific job is accessibility and also the team aspect. So um, the accessibility being, you know, you don't have the the obstacle of having to own and support and schlep around, you know, your own horse. And and clearly riders that are, are dedicated to the sport, if they're riding and showing, they want to own their own horse. So we have found that at least 60% of our riders do own or lease a horse. Um, but for the riders who maybe don't have access to that or can't afford that, at least this is a way to get into the sport and enjoy something they might not be able to otherwise. So just like, you know, if you're going to be on a high school swim team, you don't necessarily have to have a pool in your backyard to be on a swim right. team. You can learn to swim and you can find opportunities and joy through participating in the sport you love that you might not otherwise. So I think the accessibility is is the main thing that we offer and, and an entryway, a good entryway for competition. Again, you know, it, it would be very difficult to say, oh, I want to ride horses. Mom, go buy me a horse and let's go to a show tomorrow. So, you know, it's at least even for the rider who, who definitely is going to buy horses and move on down that ramp, it's a good entry level to starting to to ride and show horses and get a feel for what showing horses involves and entails and and the responsibilities of that so it's a good entry point good accessibility 
And then the team aspect is just unmatched. Like really our sport is traditionally known for being an individual sport that I go in the ring and I'm trying to beat you. And I, you might be from my same barn and I hope you do well too, but I really would prefer to beat you. So the yeah. team aspect of this is really, it, it teaches something that you really aren't going to learn in, in traditional showing. And that is, you know, you're rooting for your beginner rider to win their class just as much as your open rider, because when you put their points on the chart at the end of the day, they count the same. And your beginner rider is just as important to your team winning that day as your open rider is. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it, it really makes the kids, um, gives them an opportunity to bond, to root for each other, to work together, to learn from each other and, you know, to really develop deeper friendships. I think all of us who are connected through horses have a, a you know, a, an instant tie that binds inherently. Um, but, you know, put, put them together on a team and not only do we all love horses, but we're all competing for the same team. Now it's, it's a lot of fun. It adds a lot more fun and camaraderie to the whole thing. And that kind of leads into my next question of what do you think draws kids into the IEA? Um, well, I, I, again, I think just if you're interested in, in getting into equestrian sports, this is an easy on-ramp, you know. Um, I think IEA and probably 4-H programs are probably the best way to stick your toe in the water and try out uh, equestrian sports without jumping in too deep and, and getting in over your head, basically. Um, so I, I think that helps. And then again, the, the accessibility of it, the financial accessibility of it makes it really, um, you know, a, an affordable way to stick your toe in the water. And maybe if you don't, again, if you, if you can't get into owning your own horse, like most of my life until I was a young professional, I couldn't afford to own my own horse. A lot of times I would, could half lease one or maybe, you know, as, as a young working student or high school rider that that worked really hard somebody would loan me a horse for a few months or something or um mm -hmm. but I really never could afford my own horse so a program like IEA would have been ideal for me too like I I yeah. would have been able to at least show and you get the opportunity to not only just go to a horse show now and then like a schooling show or something but the opportunity to be on a track that has a national finals so even without owning your own horse, you can be involved in a sport that can take you all the way to a national finals level and right. to compete and, and have that kind of an opportunity and experience. So I think all of those things are are different in IEA. And, um, and I don't think they take away either from what is available to riders that can uh, afford the opportunity to have their own horse or lease a horse and go through other circuits and other programs, because I, I think the two go hand in hand. Um, there are different horsemanship skills being learned in each of those different formats. So, you know, a rider who's really looking to be well-rounded would still do IEA in addition to owning and showing their own horse, because yep. if they want to be a professional someday and they're going to catch ride, then you, this is a perfect opportunity to learn how to hop on and catch ride. So, yep. A lot of reasons to be involved in both. And if you're, you know, if you're into horses, you're going to want to ride them any, anywhere in any way you can. So. <laughs> Absolutely. That's all of us. Any opportunity, you can't pass it up. <laughs> and would you happen to know off the top of your head how many teams there are across the country and about how many kids participate in IEA every year? Yeah, we um we just were throwing these stats into some uh, some of the fun stuff we were doing at Nationals two weeks ago. So. <laughs> They're, they're pretty familiar to me right now. The, in the past year, we had a total of 14,500 members, which was our all-time wow. high so far. Wow. Um, Congratulations. Yeah. yeah we, we had, thank you. We had gone up every year in membership, and then we hit the COVID years, which were difficult. We did manage mm. to, keep, to keep showing um, during most of the COVID stuff with a lot of restrictions. And we came up basically with a whole new rule book for the COVID year and a half. Um, but we, once we, once the extreme stuff of COVID was over and we could get back to, I'm finger quoting normal, um, mm -hmm. then this year was really a big year. Everybody was just ready to get back. So again, we had 14,500 members this year that 
broke down into about 1,400 teams across the country, and that's wow. unseat Western and dressage teams. And um, and when we go back and look at, okay, how many shows did we do across the country? We did almost 1,000 horse shows this year. Wow, so, holy cow. Yeah, and, you know, most of them are fairly small one-day horse shows with about 100 to 150 rides in a day. Um, but, but, you know, when somebody says, what do you do? We put on horse shows. Oh, really? How many do you do? Well, we do about a thousand a year. It's like, gosh, <laughs> a little hard to grasp. So there's a lot of folks out there, uh, you know, within the IEA, all the coaches and, and our volunteers of regional presidents and our zone administrators and our staff, there's a lot of people out there working to put on IEA shows out there. So we're constantly appreciating them and, uh, and they, I think the kids, too, another thing they get out of IEA is learning how to put on a horse show, how to prepare the horses, mm -hmm. to, to how to school the horses, things like that, that are great opportunities for young riders that might want to move further up in the industry. Would you happen to know what, say, like the percentage of riders is who move from the IEA into the IHSA once they get to the collegiate level? You know, we've not done formal tracking of those stats, unfortunately. Um, I think we're we're getting there. We're just now all getting our databases to a point where we can start to match them up and see what those numbers are. Right. Um, so I would be just ballparking something like, I, I would think at least 50% of our riders mm, wow. are to ride in college. Yeah. So it's high. And Amazing. It was, yeah, it's, it's interesting. We were at a this was a few a few years back now, but we were at an NCEA, um, the National Collegiate Equestrian Association, at the mm -hmm. at their national meeting. This was probably about five years ago, and there was and uh, we were in the room uh, with with their board of directors, and they were saying, well, we don't know if IEA is really you know the fit for us. We get most of our hunt seat riders from like the Metal McClay finals and this and that. And we went around the room. And it turns out every single NCEA team had at least one IEA rider on it. And we said, well, yeah, there you go. They're they're not just going to IHSA. They're also going to the NCEA. And, mm -hmm. and now from our dressage program, they're going to the IDA, the Intercollegiate Dressage Association. So wow. we are hopeful that our new and dressage is very new for us we're only we've only had it about three years now and uh we're very hopeful that our program will help feed up into their program and really grow the intercollegiate dressage program significantly one more thing i really want to wrap up just to hit home for people how big of a factor the iea is in these kids lives and the opportunities that it gives them could you share a story that stands out to you about um, a, an IEA rider, whether it be a cool story or a success story, is, is anything come to mind? I, I I think, again, the coolest thing is that so many of our riders are comfortable moving on to the college level. And I think for the industry at large, um, there was a gap, you know, like it, it's a big transition to go from I'm riding in high school to I'm riding in college. And especially if you've only been showing your own horse, it's a, it's a lot of work to take a horse off to college with you or to switch programs and take your horse. So, um, so I think it's really important that a lot of, of our riders are then comfortable moving on to ride on their college teams. And we see so much success from those riders. And I think so many of them so many of the college teams are looking for them now. Like, gosh, if, if it's between a rider who's done draw-based riding in IEA versus they haven't, it's a lot easier to integrate somebody on your team that's got that whole experience already than right. someone who's never done draw-based format and who hasn't ridden on a team before. So I think there are a zillion success stories out there. Um, I think a couple of, of uh, folks that, that, people would recognize their names, you know, that have come through IEA, a couple that just jump in my head is um, Jacob Pope, who rode in the IEA mm -hmm. back in um, like 2010, 11, 12, in, in that era. And and mm -hmm. he went on to win, you know, EAP finals and the USCT and McClay. And now he rides as a professional. And so that that's certainly a name a lot of people would recognize in the hunt seat world. Um, on the on the western side, we've got uh, Trevor Dare, whose mother is a coach in in our program, 
and uh, Trevor was one of was in the IEA on the western side early on when we first started and he was I think maybe rode as a junior and senior on an IEA team and he's one of the top riders in the in the NRHA reigning now he won the derby last year which was huge um I I also uh um on the hunt seat side um Allie Joyce who won the adult finals at Capital Challenge, the Ariat medal final back in like mm-hmm. 2015. So she came up through the IEA. Um, those yeah. are a couple that, that you know, I've met along the way or maybe know know their coach a little better and, and their stories come to mind right away. But I, I think there's so many stories. I mean, just, just you today spouting off a great <laughs> of being connected to the IEA too. So we, we love hearing those stories and we were as part of our 20th anniversary, I think one of the things we want to continue to do is capturing stories um, of IEA riders and their success and their connection to the industry in any way going forward. And as a young rider, you might, you know, just the opportunity to ride or show somebody's horse Mm -hmm. and IEA has given you that experience. So you can say, yes, I I think I can just hop on and show your horse for you. Yeah. Yep, it gives you a certain type of confidence. Mm-hmm. In your and also, it could be the most nerve-wracking showing. I, I know there's, you know, a lot of kids that that are are performing at the top level at you know Metal McClay and Top Equitation and all those things, and and they'll say, well, I, you know, I know what I'm I know what I'm getting when I get there. I might be nervous about what the course is going to be, but I know me and I know my horse and I know what we're gonna, you know, how we're gonna react each time. Versus here's this IEA thing and I know I'm prepared, but I don't know which horse I'm going to get. And I really do better on a horse that needs Mm -hmm. a lot of leg. But unfortunately, I drew the horse that that is a little quick. And so, uh, yeah, you got to really adjust your comfort level to say, I'm going to handle this problem, too. Yeah, ride the horse I have today. And then just to wrap things up, I wanted to ask if there's anything more you wanted to add or share about the IEA that you would like people to know about. Oh, gosh. Um, I just want to appreciate the folks who participate in the IEA, the folks who support the IEA. Um, We have a a lot of sponsor support. This year at our nationals, we had almost $300,000 of of awards and scholarships and prizes. And uh, that just keeps going up. And and that's, again, we just want to have give opportunity to the kids out there. And so, you know, it comes from the whole circle of people that make the IEA possible. So ongoing, ongoing support from, from participants, from the families, from the moms and dads out there and our, our sponsors and, and um, the fellow associations. We love the IE in the IEA. We just love working together with the other equestrian associations. And, um, you know, again, our goal is just to keep start people in this in the industry and keep them in the industry, whether they're professionals or amateurs. And so we love connecting and working with the other equine associations too. So we just want to be part of, you know, the pyramid that keeps kids. We figure the more we can pull in at the at the bottom of the pyramid, at the base entry level of riding, the bigger the pyramid will get at the top with people staying in the industry. So that's really our main goal is to bring bring riders and families into equestrian sports and uh, let them find their own path once they're in here. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been excellent. Thank you thank for you. sharing your knowledge of the IEA and it's been great to get to know you. And I hope, I know that there will be generations of kids to continue doing this and it's a great thing what you've started. And I know I appreciate it and I'm sure lots of other kids and families do as well. Thank you. Nice chatting with you, Julia. Thanks for listening to this week's episode with Roxanne Durant, and a big thank you to the sponsor of this week's episode, Troxel. Learn more at TroxelHelmets.com. You can subscribe to the Practical Horseman podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. While you're there, please rate and review the show. Also, tune into our new mini sewed series, which comes out every other Sunday, called The Fod Pod. You'll hear audio lessons from our favorite Practical Horseman On Demand videos. At Practical Horseman On Demand, you can enjoy hundreds of how-to videos and get insider access to exclusive interviews and lectures, slow motion demonstrations, and step-by-step tutorials taught by top-level pros in the hunter, jumper, equitation, and eventing disciplines. When you tune into the FOD pod, listen closely for a promo code for 15% off your Practical Horseman On Demand subscription. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode. 
I'm Julia Murphy, and you've been listening to the Practical Horseman Podcast.